USCHO.com. This is the USCHO Week in Review podcast from U.S. College Hockey Online at USCHO.com. A look at this weekend in college hockey and a review of the top news of the week. Welcome to USCHO Weekend Review for May 3rd, 2022. I'm Ed Trefsker alongside Jim Connolly and Derek Schooley. This podcast is brought to you by DCU Digital Federal Credit Union. What will DCU mean to you? Find out today by visiting dcu.org. Membership required. Well, gents, uh, this is our first podcast since the Frozen Four. And maybe we'll start out by eating a little crow. Our predictions were all wrong. All of us had Minnesota State uh, defeating Denver in close games on April 9th. Uh, But instead, Denver uh, really just totally turned the game around in the third period. It was such a fast momentum shift when Denver got a couple of quick goals. And uh, then they just kind of rode the rest of the way and and put Minnesota State back on their heels. What's your take on that game and uh, and on Denver? Well, first of all, I will say that I really enjoyed being on the other side, another side of uh, the Frozen Four, being the the multiple hats I've worn. But this was this was really neat to see from a media perspective and to sit up with you guys in the the booth and see everything that you guys do. And there's a reason USCHO is the 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 place to go for college hockey info because you guys did a, a great job up there. But I will tell you, we looked really really smart for two periods. Like we looked outstanding. It, this was a, a one-sided game uh, for two periods. And then when it counted, Denver, Denver picked it up. They uh, found another gear. They got some goals. They took the momentum. They seized the momentum. And I think Michigan, uh, Michigan State, uh, Minnesota State was flustered, shocked. And I think that things just went downhill in a quick hurry. They leaked oil and they couldn't stop it. And I will say the one thing that stopped the game from being a Maverick national championship, they couldn't get that second goal. They couldn't get that second goal and they couldn't get that second goal. That that was the only thing, because I think if they would have got that second goal, they would have uh, uh, moved forward. Yeah, And I think too, Derek, you know, Dryden McKay, and I'm not putting any of this really on him, but the first goal, the tying goal was, was a, a kind of an uncharacteristic Dryden McKay rebound. And I think, you know, it shocked maybe him that the puck went in the net. It shocked his teammates that he let that rebound out. It shocked the coaches that there was a man that uncovered in front of the net. When you look, I mean, you can go back to those first two periods of that game and, you know, one nothing lead from Minnesota State through two. And I couldn't, I could count on one hand the number of quality chances that Denver had to score. You know, they, they were shut out of the house and it was a great defensive effort by Minnesota state, but you said, and I think Mike Hastings used the exact same metaphor in his post game that they started to leak oil and they just didn't have it. They couldn't stop it fast enough. And the fact that the second goal came so quick after the first goal I think then Minnesota State just couldn't recompose themselves and say, okay, guys, not a big deal. We're down one. We'll go find the goal, and then, hey, we'll find a way to win it. Maybe it's overtime. Maybe we get another. Who knows? But that offense just couldn't have a response. And when Denver you know, potted that third goal with uh, – there wasn't much time left, five minutes left, it was over. I mean, there was no chance. I mean, everybody – the whole building knew it. There was nothing that – you could sit there and say, Oh, you know, pull the goalie and you know, they're getting such great pressure. Minnesota state suddenly had no pressure. They hadn't had really good offensive pressure since midway through the second period. They had kind of formed that defensive shell. And as you said, Derek, you don't expand that lead to two to nothing. You don't get that cushion. And now when you make that one mistake, it ends up at being a tie game and the momentum turned. And, and, you know, congratulations to Denver. You you said it, Ed. We ate crow. We have to, you know, I didn't get a single game right in the Frozen Four. I got every one of them wrong, I think. I might, I, I might did I? No, I think I picked Minnesota. I think I picked an all And you run a final. gambling site, too. I, I do, you run a gambling <laughs> pool. <laughs> yeah, well, no, what I would say to, to, to uh, people that read my gambling column, don't follow my picks. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that the one thing that they, you also got to remember Denver got a goal disallowed too. 
So they, they had all this going. And right before they tied it at one, Minnesota State did have a good chance. I don't remember if it hit their hit the knob or the post. Yeah, they had a good, yeah. So they had a couple chances that they just couldn't. They had a couple shorthanded breakaways too to to extend it. There was a lot of, and we're talking a month ago. So uh, don't don't let's not get the fact checker out. Um, uh, all the all the people out there, but there was a lot of chances for them to extend that lead, not just a two to three to nothing and didn't get it done. How about the job David Carl did in the frozen four Denver in the semifinal in the overtime win against Michigan played uh, almost a, a perfectly executed game and they didn't get rattled and kept at it and uh, turned the tide uh, in the championship game. I thought the composure that Denver showed probably has a lot to do with who David Carl is as a coach. And you could you know, we spent four days with them Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, listening to him every day. And the tone never changed. It, the, he doesn't get high. He doesn't get low. You know, I don't know that that's always the perfect style. Some players like, you know, a coach that is a little bit more emotional, but his, he was so calm the entire time. And, you know, he had been there before as a coach. And I guess there was maybe one or two players that had been in that 2019 frozen four, not a lot. So there wasn't a ton of experience, but you, know, you had some, you had his personal experience that he could take out of that overtime loss in the semis in 2019. And I think he probably applied a lot of those life lessons to how he approached the entire week. And it showed they were a calm team. You know, they could have been rattled by Michigan, I thought, in that semifinal when when the Wolverines tied the game. You know, you felt like you had control, then Michigan ties it. They didn't get rattled. And I, I thought that that was very important. And obviously in the national title game, you I think they had had, what was it, eight shots on goal through two periods and maybe two quality attempts. And they didn't get rattled again. So I think the bad, they, that team really took the persona of its, its head coach, maybe its entire coaching staff, uh, and just brought it out onto the ice. And, and the one thing I will say is experience does, I mean, experience is everything. And I think they went through the, the tough one in Buffalo where, you know, David was in his first year and, you know, and kind of in the shadow of Jim Montgomery, a little bit of, of everything they was trying to do. And um, he certainly stepped out of any shadow that, that there was cast from whether it was George, whether it was uh, Jim Montgomery. I mean, the, the coaches that have won there have, have just been, been outstanding and you go to the list of Denver coaches all the way back Frank Saratori was a coach at Denver I mean and he's he's Mark uh creating his own path and and taking his own uh journey and destination and then he uh, congratulations to them because uh nobody not many people gave him a chance well, let's just to, uh, move in, in on to one, uh, our next topic uh, let alone uh, game two at the end of every season there are going to be some coaching openings and some are still unfilled one just got filled uh, just before we started recording. Uh, Adam Nightingale was hired at his alma mater, Michigan State, as the head coach. And we haven't had a lot of time to dig into that. But uh, it seems like it's following a familiar pattern, Jim. Yeah, I mean, another guy that comes from the U.S. National Team Development Program, uh, just like Denton Cole did. Um, I did. It does sound like Adam, a little less experienced, a little younger uh, of a coach. Um, he was at Shattuck. Uh, for some time, I think he coached the 14 U team there and um, had some success with them. But you know, he's not that far out of college. I believe he graduated from state in 2005. Only played two seasons there. He started his career at Lake Superior State and uh, transferred. Um, but you know, you, they, they they went with youth here. I mean, this is when you look at back at who they had and you know Ron Mason and Rick Comley and uh, Tom Anastas and Danton Cole all pretty experienced, you know, in what they done, they had done in coaching. This is a guy that's never really had a, a college job at a head coaching level. So they're going to take a chance on, on, on youth and see where it goes. I, I don't know, you know, we, we talk about the big 10 a lot and, you know, does this feel like a big 10 hire? Maybe not, but you know, maybe sometimes you, we also look around the country. We just mentioned David Carl, we look at what uh, Greg Carville has done, Eric Lang has done, some of these younger coaches, you know, uh, Jerry Keefe, Norm Bazin. I mean, they're winners. They're, they're turning te teams into winners despite the fact that they don't come in with a, a 20, 30 year coaching resume. 
So uh, I think that might have been a lot of the focus uh, for Michigan State. Um, so we'll, we'll see where it goes. I don't know enough about him to make a judgment. And I would be the same way. Um, I've, I've met him once or twice and in, in very, very, we've been on the, on this podcast longer than I've ever, ever talked to him and met him in passing. But, uh, you know, I watched the U S games in the U 18, they played with an up tempo style. You know, obviously there's a history of, of a long history with Ron Mason and, and Rick Comley of national championships, but, uh, three in a row with alums going with, uh, Tom and Astis and, and Danton and now, uh, uh, Nightingale. So we'll see where this one takes them. And, uh, you know, I think the one thing that, that this will reinvigorate the, anytime there's a coaching change, this will reinvigorate the alumni and the excitement. They've got a beautiful facility coming. I saw pictures on it with their new locker room, a weight room and entrance to the building, which will be a really neat thing for a, a storied program. And Mich- and Mon Arena is a really nice building that got a little tired especially when you put it up against the likes of Mariucci and uh, the Cole Center and uh, Yoast. And I think this will really help engage some enthusiasm for, for the building. But uh, I think you're going to be judged on the results. And he's going to have to – he's got some tough battles to win in the state of Michigan with Michigan and in Minnesota and to get to that high level. And they haven't won a playoff game in seven years. That's where you're going to see if this is a good hire or not. Well, when we look back east, there are a couple of openings in the Boston area, BU and BC, and both Boston University and Boston College have a a tradition of kind of promoting from within and bringing in alumni. Uh, Jim, why don't we start with Boston University? The name that keeps floating out there is the associate head coach, Jay Pandolfo. Any other names out there and and maybe your take on on him as as a possible head coach? Yeah, I I had heard some other names floated out there, but I I don't know that we're going to see. Um, it, it it does sound like it will be Pandolfo. I, my question was why it was taking so long, but somebody that has more of an inside at BU than I do mentioned something about May first. I don't know what it had to do some something with Albie O'Connell's contract, the the, the most recent coach. I don't know why they couldn't make the hire before then, or there could be, you know, personnel issues in, in some of these universities become so bureaucratic that, um, that that can delay the hiring. So my, my thought was if it's going to be Jay Pandolfi, you could have hired, you know, hired him two weeks later, if, you know, cause he's been inside the program. He came there from the Boston Bruins just this season uh, to take over as an associate head coach. And, um, I think that there's you know, high expectations for him because he, you know, he is an alum. He does have some ex- experience and some su- success at the national hockey league level. Um, but he's, he's also a brilliant, you know, he was a great hockey player at BU, a great hockey player in the NHL. So uh, see how that translates to the college game. Um, but it, it does sound like they're ready to make an announcement this week. I've heard as early as possibly uh, to, tomorrow that being Wednesday. So uh, we'll see where that goes. And the other position, of course, you know, Jerry York, a 50 year veteran coach, and he had been at BC. It's, I mean, it's in terms of my covering BC, he's the only coach I've ever known. So um, he decided to finally step aside after 50 seasons uh, as a head coach. And that's a tougher one to fill. And, uh, you know, we've heard names thrown around Greg Brown, Mike Cavanaugh, even Nate Lehman, who, you know, I was on the phone with a uh, longtime Boston Herald scribe, John Connolly last week. And we were figuring out it's been almost a hundred years since Boston college did not have a, an alum behind their bench. Um, and I couldn't even tell you the, the, the person's name that that goes that far back. You can think back to, you know, Snooks Kelly only played at BC for one year, but he played there for one year and then coached there forever. And, you know, Lenny Siglarski and Steve Cedar Chuck, and I'm not going to count Mike Milbury because he was only there for 10 days. And then of course, Jerry York, but that's a big, that's a big job to fill. And, you know, there's such high expectations. Um, you know, we look at Greg Brown. He had stayed around for a long time as an associate head coach. Then he decided to move on. I don't know if that kind of upset the apple cart at all. Mike Cavanaugh, he's doing great things down at UConn. It feels like he's got such a good situation. And then to hear the name Nate Lehman thrown out there last week, that one interests me. You know, he's a good coach. He's had some success, obviously, in national championship in 2015. Um, and he's his athletic director, Bob Driscoll, who he was very close with, just retired. So, you know, 
sometimes you feel that you can change when there is change within an organization. So I don't know I, the, both of these jobs feel like they could have been slam dunks, you know, just go with a, you know, Greg Brown, go with Jay Pandolfo, but we're still here on May 3rd trying to figure out who, who each school will hire. You know, the funny thing about all this is you've got three blue bloods right now that, that are open, you know, uh, the history, the pageantry, the names associated with there. Um, you know, we talked about some of the names at Michigan State, but and you've mentioned the names at BU and BC. I mean, uh, those are who's who in college hockey. And to have all three of these jobs open at once, and, you know, I'm sure we'll get to the, the Michigan aspect of what's going on there. That, that would be four big jobs. I don't know if that's going to open. I don't think it is uh, everything that I read, but that would be four big jobs that, are, that would open. And um, wow. I mean, who would have thought that? I mean, I was looking, you always look at jobs and you go, or job, who's going to, what's going to open where and what's going to, you couldn't have predicted this. You couldn't have predicted that these, that all these would open at the same time. And, um, but I will go to say this, congratulations to Jerry York um, going out on his own terms, didn't do a retirement tour, uh, just decided it was time to, to, play more golf and see his grandkids in Pittsburgh. Um, always very nice. Um, you know, played in our tournament, the three years classic twice. Cause he's got family here. Um, he's been in Pittsburgh a lot. I always text me and, and ask me if I've played Oakmont, not if I've played moon, <laughs> moon country club down the road here, which is a public <laughs> course. He, he goes, right. He goes, you played Oakmont lately. I played Oakmont once in the, the 18 years I've been here. But, uh, you know, what a nice guy and, um, congratulations to him. He was, he was coaching at Bowling Green when I played in, in 1990 through 94. That should, should show you a lot. Never actually played. Have we, I've never coached against him, uh, in a game. We, we talked about Red Berenson at the frozen four, uh, Jack Parker, Jeff Jackson, uh, some of them, but never once they were in the tournament with us twice, but we never played them. I do say I had t been asked the question for probably the last decade, when's Jerry York going to retire? And I, I had said, I knew he would always go out on his own terms, but I, I also thought that he could be like the horse you can't put out to pasture, you know, that he would get a little bit too wild. And he, he wouldn't enjoy sitting in the barn at all any longer. Uh, I don't know what his retirement life will be like. Um, but I will say I, I called the last game for Boston College uh, of this season on Nesson. And there was just something about the way he lingered on the bench that night. And he just kind of all the players were gone and he was just kind of looking at the ice. And it may I actually said it to my play by play partner, Tyler Murray uh, at the time. I said, boy, he, that was a long time that he kind of stayed on uh, around who knows if he had made that decision at that point, it, it obviously had been in his mind. I don't think that is a decision that just pops up one day, but um, again, you know, echoing what you said, Derek, you know, he did have a fantastic career. So congratulations on him for, for 50 successful years, five national championships. You know, he, he will go down and, you know, member of both the U S and uh hockey hall of fames you know both hockey hall of fames that's a not a lot of players coaches leaders builders whatever category you want to put them in not a lot of people can claim that and there really are maybe only a couple if any coaches active right now who have any kind of shot at equaling his 1123 victories um one of them is david carl who we mentioned because he also started at the age of 27 he could throw Rand Pecknold in there if he coaches long enough. He started at that same young age. And uh, so, you know, but but that's even a stretch. Uh, so I, whoa, 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 whoa. what about me? I'm at 275. I only need another thousand. <laughs> OK, um, <laughs> let's see if you get uh, 25 wins a year. That's another 40 years. And uh, I'm 51. Yeah, maybe so oh, you could 52. still be 90. Well, you know, we saw we saw Red Berenson uh, at the age of 82. We saw him in Boston. I think he could still be coaching. So I don't saying, think he's lost a step. So you're saying I have a chance? I'm saying you have a chance. <laughs> <laughs> you can't have a nine loss season in there. A uh, nine win season. That, you that's have right. To you got to get 25. 25 plus for a long time. So you're saying there's a chance. Okay. Let's talk about one more coaching thing before uh, 
we take a break here. And that's Michigan. Now, all the all the Internet wags who trade on rumor and speculation were convinced and were trying to convince everybody else that uh, Mel was toast, that he was done when his uh, current contract expired um, last Saturday. But then uh, yesterday, Monday, uh, May 2nd, there's Mel with a couple of photos on social media in his office with the trophies and the whole bit. And uh, his athletic director, Ward Manuel, said coach will be fine. Um, I, I think they're just uh, working things out, you know, dealing with some of the issues that came up this season. And and uh, I guess uh, I don't bet on stuff like this, but I'd say the odds are awfully, awfully high that Mel Pearson's behind the bench for the next season. I agree with you. Um, what a troll picture. What a way to to send a, a message out to everybody with with him in the office and all the championship trophies. Um, so it, uh, you know, I think if you if you read the internet and you you buy into everything that that's been out there and yeah, there's a lot of good rationale of why he wouldn't be back. Um, I think the people at the Michigan Daily Journal have really dove into this and and done a a, a pretty good job on on. Uh, going through the whole process of everything that's happened. But um, I have a hard time believing that uh, a coach that just went to the, the final four is not going to be returning. And obviously I don't think you would sell those pictures and um, everything that's come out of the Michigan SID's office and all that stuff. If, if he was not returning. Yeah. 100% agree. I think he, you'll see him back uh, probably with, I don't know how long the contract will be, um, maybe it's only a two or three year extension to what he currently has. And listen, <laughs> if, uh, if he was a coach, I, I know, I know him too well. And I know how competitive he is. He would not just walk away because of this, but next year is going to be a tough year in Michigan. They have, we knew how great they were this year, but they've lost a lot. Um, and you don't just rebuild from that, that this is, you know, I was around Jerry York. We just talked about Jerry, but I was around his teams when he lost five or six. And, but right now I think the, the head counts up to eight, uh, in the Michigan lineup. That's a lot of guys to leave early, uh, to the NHL. So I think that that is one of the areas that you have to kind of look at and say, uh, you know, there's a potential that it's going to be just tough sledding for Mel, um, next year. But I, I don't think that that's the reason that he would walk away himself. He's he's too competitive for that. Well, we've got more of the show to go. Uh, we're going to talk about some things that developed from the coaches convention in Naples, Florida. Uh, some news about Illinois, maybe some other storylines to watch over the off season. We're going to take a pause. Uh, this podcast is brought to you by DCU, Digital Federal Credit Union. Visit dcu.org. This is the USCHO Week in Review podcast from U.S. College Hockey Online. Sometimes it's not about wanting a new car, it's about needing one. And I needed one I could rely on. So I got an auto loan with DCU. They offer the same low rates on both new and used cars. And I was able to borrow a little extra to make a used car as good as new. My auto loan from DCU means a ride I can finally rely on, which feels like a pretty big thing. What will DCU mean to you? Insured by NCUA. Membership required. Visit dcu.org. Welcome back to Weekend Review from USCHO. I'm Ed Trefsker alongside Jim Conley and Derek Schooley. Derek, uh, as a coach and with your program coming back one season down the road, uh, you were involved in the coaches convention and there were some interesting things discussed. And one of the things you mentioned to us was looking at some numbers about overtime. There were a lot of questions raised this past season about the 55 45 split given to uh, an overtime win with three on three and some number crunching really told us that maybe it doesn't make that big a difference. Yeah, I think that was a big topic of discussion and, I, th- I think it's going to be hard to go away from, from the three on three overtime. I think there's a lot of people out there that want to go back to five on five, but know that college hockey would be the only league in basically all the world that doesn't play three on three overtime. Um, I know all in North America from the USHL, all the, the leagues, they play three on three, but 
going through things at 55, 45, I think one of the things that a lot of coaches expressed, they didn't want a lot of, uh, you know, reward for, or I guess penalty for losing in overtime. You want to get there. So 55, 45 was like a tie, uh, moving up to any, any different reason, uh, moving up to a 60, 40, a 67, 33, and a 75-25 does not change the field at all from this past year. Uh, there, if you go to 100-0, to zero, um, all credit on three-on-three three overtime, there is one change. I'm not going to tell you who the, the change is because I don't want fans to get all, all up in arms, but there would be been one change, and it was a big change, actually. But I think that I don't think there's an appetite for that. Uh, people talk about 100-0. People talk about uh, going to five on five. There may be a small tweak in the, the 67, 33, maybe, because I think that's what the, the women use. Um, but I don't think there's much appetite. And I, I, I have a hard time thinking that they're going to change. But I could be wrong. I think what you're going to see is the, the next step in the process. And I know you want to talk about some of the other rules that have been discussed is there's this uh, coaches survey that goes out to all the coaches in uh, within the, after the uh, right before the rules meeting, which is in the first week of July, I believe it's the first week of July. It used to be. Um, and there'll be a survey going out and they will take those results. Anything that happened, they took the straw poll, they got the temperature of the room. They felt that how everybody felt. They kind of gave everybody their rationale. And now there'll be a survey that goes out to all the coaches that people will then uh, fill out and then they'll, they'll make their decisions from there. I think, you know, I think it's none of that surprises me, Derek, when, you know, I heard so much throughout the season, especially Ed and I, when we would talk to coaches on our spotlight podcast and a lot of, Oh, I 55, 45 just doesn't make sense. doesn't make sense. But then you, once you actually go to make the change, it's more difficult to make. So I'm not surprised to hear that it's not likely to change. And if it does, you know, to go to 67, 33 and follow the, the footprint of the women's, I get that a little bit more. That kind of also follows the international hockey um, model t- as well, because it's three points for a win, two points for uh, an overtime win, one point for an overtime loss and zero points for a regulation loss. So basically 67, 33 accomplishes exactly that. Um, I, you know, I just change is difficult. And I think that there's still so many purists in the college game more so than in any level of hockey um, that really just still don't understand why three on three has value. Uh, I like it. I think fans like it, but I'm not sure that, I mean, you probably, you definitely have a majority of coaches that like it. But you don't have, you know, what would, what's the what do they call it in the house when you have, you know, more than two thirds of the seats in, in the Senate or something like that? Super majority, <laughs> super majority. Like, I don't think you have a super majority of coaches that that are in that. You know, it's barely no, something that uh, is is, you know, passing as it is. So I, I if they stay the same for two more years, fine. But there will be coaches that eventually will will probably fall in line and cha- and want change. Uh, but it, you know, it just doesn't feel like it's been there. And, and as much as you hear coaches complain when the final vote comes in and somebody has to make a decision, it's a lot more difficult. My favorite take all season on this with the people we talked to was from Notre Dame head coach, Jeff Jackson. He said uh, three on three, it's good for the game. I know why we do it. And I hate it. <laughs> that, that was my favorite take on the whole thing. I mean, I think that and that's probably a lot of people. I mean, it's it's not as exciting as a coach as he, he used to. He used to think that it'd be up and down. Now it's become a pull back, attack. If you don't have it, bring it out, regroup, wait, and attack again. It, it's where it gets exciting is when you miss the net or you uh, put a puck wide and then you got to go back and then they miss the net or the, the goalie kicks the rebound out and then it goes back and then you got to slow it down again. and it, it goes in spurts. So, uh, I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm, maybe I misread everything that I heard down there. I, I don't know. I, there's a lot of people that would like to go back. Like Jimmy said, purist, but I, I, I'm, 
I have a hard time believing that, that it will happen, but it could be wrong. Let me ask you a question from a coaching standpoint, Derek. Something that I think I noticed, maybe it was just my perception, but you talk about on the three on three and going back and resetting and, and coming back up ice. It seems to me I saw more teams do that five on five this season than I have in previous seasons. Maybe, maybe things aren't working out right and they'll come back and reset and maybe, maybe I uh, get a change in while they're back in neutral ice and then reattack. Is, is that coming into the game? I feel like also add to add to that, it's especially in four on four, you know, when you get matching minors, you see teams resetting. So I think that that, I think that the three on three mindset and teaching probably carries into regulation in certain other situations. Well, I watched in the, in the NHL game, just a, you know, neutral zone. He's just defenseman just stand still sometimes. And I never saw that in college games until this year, until it happened a couple of times and uh, looking for the right play, letting changes happen, letting them get set up. So it, um, I think, you know, we, we bring, we want our game to be a lot like the NHL. And I think we're getting our wish and that, and, and that's where we're at. But I mean, I think Todd, Todd Maluski did a great job in, in going over. He must have had a, a better source than me because he didn't talk to me, but he did a great job of, of going through everything. I think what he said was right. No matter what happens, somebody's going to be upset. And the people that are, that are all in favor of, of uh, three on three, the five on five majority is a lot louder than the three on three because the three on three is all over hockey. So the five on five majority is a lot louder. So you're just going to hear some negativity and, um, I think to say that there's nothing wrong with a good tie. I used to always say that, ah, oh, nothing wrong with a good tie, but I think our society's got away from ties in all sports. I don't know of any sports that have ties anymore. Are there regular really. season Maybe football soccer. when, when, when overtime <laughs> runs out, that's like, runs hours. Yeah. yeah. Soccer. Yeah. European soccer. It's still big. Yeah. So, I mean, there's not much. So I think we're, we're falling back, but once again, Todd did a Todd did a really good job in in the in the in his Wisconsin Journal paper uh, writing a, a little bit about uh, all the rule changes and you know not really a, a lot. There's this is a rule changing year, but you know some of the stuff uh, you know like the we just changed the face off thrown out the going to the international role that was debated a little bit. Uh, removing the penalty after you score a goal during a delayed minor penalty. I really like that rule. I think it, 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 it makes sense to me. I don't know why we were ever in that, that uh, uh, just because you score a goal six on five with a delayed minor, you're still playing the same strength. You've taken the chance to shoot the puck in your own net. Um, why, why do you not get the power play out of the deal? And I think that's one of the things that college hockey has been really unique with. Um, I would hate to see that rule change, but it, it was discussed, um, you know, playing pucks off the, the, the screen. I think that's going to be hard. Some buildings have it all the way down the side. Do you just play it in the, the ends? I mean, and then obviously a lot was discussed on when a game ends. And I think we all know why. And Don Lucci did a good job of explaining that at the frozen four about, about what went on. But, um, there's, like I said, the, the, the next process is a survey that goes to the coaches. The coaches will then have a chance to uh, give their, it's a uh, click survey where you, yes or no, check a box, whatever, and then you could write comments in. And uh, I think this one's going to be very important because there are a lot of, of uh, little rules on the agenda that you're going to go, huh, why'd we do that? News that broke yesterday on Monday, May 2nd was that Illinois is no longer going to be pursuing division one hockey. Uh, they seemed very close right before COVID hit. One of the things they pointed out was a 30% increase in building the facility that they would need. But I think underneath this, we also have to look at some other things and maybe this is something that came up uh, being prepared for uh, getting rid of the limit of 18 scholarships and maybe not putting a limit on that and not putting a limit on three coaches on the payroll Add into that the transfer portal and what can happen with name, image, and likeness. And the whole landscape is very different now than when Illinois was first looking at this four or five years ago. 
Yeah, I have to wonder, Ed, you know, if you had to go back and do run all the numbers again with everything that you just mentioned, not just the building facilities, but the additional scholarship expenses, the additional. And these are still many of these still hypothetical, but we think that we're going to see in the next couple of years that the NCAA will go to a, you know, a much more expensive business model where the bigger schools should have an advantage. And then you look at Illinois and you look at all these schools that have been running these feasibility studies and the, the number, the bottom line is not going up at just a simple rate of, you know, 3% per year, because that's what cost of living moves. This is really going up. And, you know, obviously we know that costs are, are higher right now, but we also know that the NCAA is in a very major transition right now. Uh, and I think that when we have a new NCAA pr- president, we haven't mentioned that Mark Emmert has uh, announced he will step aside. But when you have a new NCAA president, uh, I think that we're going to see a whole new structure for what NCAA athletics looks like. And unfortunately, I do feel it is going to be more expensive. And I do think that the smaller schools out there could suffer. Well, it's crazy when you hear everything that's being talked about. And you think, oh, that that can't happen. Unlimited scholarship, unlimited coaches, <laughs> um, all that kind of stuff. And you think that, oh, that 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 won't happen, but it's probably closer to happening than we think. And uh, I think a lot's going to come, you know, with the what's it, the transformational uh, thing that they they're putting together. I don't even know the correct term behind it, but uh, Greg Dana from the NCAA spoke to the coaches about it and. Um, I think there's just a lot of different things that could happen and a lot of questions. And with that come not a lot of answers. And you talk about things rise, but the three, the typical 3% isn't 3% because gas is a lot higher today for buses than it was the last time the Colonials took a bus. So it, uh, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out over the next, uh, you know, couple of weeks, couple of months, couple of years. You got to ask the question, is there a function, is there a need for the NCAA going forward uh, as the overarching body over all of college athletics? Because a number of the things they were in place for was looking at scholarship limits and watching out for what boosters might do. But with some of these name, image and likeness things, it's, it's like doling out cash for everybody at big schools. Uh, are we in a point where maybe 10 years down the road, there is no NCAA and different sports have their own federations uh, uh, to, to govern playoffs and so forth? Oh, are you, are you really, we want to go a second hour now? Is that what you're trying to tell me here? <laughs> well, we can, we can wrap it up there. I guess that's Mike, something that Mike, we can watch over the summer. Is Mike Snee going to be our new commissioner of college hockey? I mean, at uh, that, that's already been tried once by the in that in that thing, but you know maybe Steve Metcalf. He, he's uh, he's I'm sure he's probably upset that he hasn't got a, a talk about today. He's he could be the new czar of college hockey, but no, I think you, you you're going to see a lot changed, and um, you know I think you're going to see a lot changed, and it's not it's not starting at hockey. It, we're we're going to be farther down the line. It's going to start at basketball and it's gonna start at football, and you're going to see what the power fives do and, and work from there. Um, you know, I, I've even heard that the power fives are going to have their own championship and that everybody else will play for a, basically an NIT type championship through the NCAA. Uh, there are not enough power fives in, in college hockey to do that. So how do you do that for each sport? I think you're a long way away from that, but it's worth looking at. And we could be here debating, uh, you know, everything from that, but I've, I just think that there's so much on the horizon that that's so we don't know. You don't know. I mean, would the, the pit football guy get offered 3 million in a house in Southern Cal? I don't know how many hockey teams that are going to be able to the hockey schools are going to be able to do that for hockey players. That's for sure. Oh, the other thing that that comes into play with that too, is the idea of standalone conferences. College hockey has one power five conference and the rest are standalone do the other five conferences and maybe other ones down the road that may pop up uh, affiliate with or get absorbed by big conferences? I mean, the speculation already started with the Summit League and the NCHC with 
Josh Fenton moving to be its commissioner. Uh, that may be something that pops up down the road too. And we, we've already seen it discussed before in Hockey East. Uh, they had discussed uh, using America East. From a, it, that was more of an administration standpoint, but still there's a, there's a lot. Um, I know that the benefits today are greater than the benefits even two years ago to doing that and what the future of the NCAA's structure looks like. You, you know, we heard it from a, a number of commissioners at the Frozen Four, Josh Fenton being one of them, but that it, it <clears throat> there will be more benefits to having an all sport conference as opposed to a standalone conference. So uh, we, it's, it's, it's not too early to keep an eye on it. Be, and I, and, you know, the fact that you had somebody at the coaches convention from the NCAA speaking almost on these exact topics uh, means that there is probably more motion, uh, you know, in progress than we all realize. But um, I don't know what, how, what the NCAA looks like in 10 years. I do think that whoever, whomever gets chosen for the next president's job, will have a, a large influence on dictating that. And there's some big names out there right now. Um, I just, but the, I do, I do know that the NCAA needs to choose wisely because the next leader will probably be putting this organization through a major overhaul. I got, uh, I got a correction on my timeline. Uh, the survey will go out uh, within the next month. The NCA Rules uh, Committee gets together June 14th through the 17th. And then after that, it's uh, everything's approved in July. So that's kind of you'll, you'll you'll get a little bit more of, of everything going forward here um, with with all the rules. One thing that I think we'd be remiss. Congratulations to Garrett Raboyne, the first coach at Augustana as well. I think, uh, you know, done a great job for Bob Motzko at, at uh University of Minnesota and uh, Bob's going to have uh, tough uh, shoes to fill in Garrett. Nothing's nothing's more exciting than starting a program from scratch. Only if you do it twice. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll look forward to uh, seeing how things go and we look forward to one more season with you, Derek, as you get things rolling again at Robert Morris, but that's going to wrap it up for the season. We'll keep our eye out. If anything big breaks during the summer, otherwise we'll catch you again. Uh, in the fall for Derek Schooley, for Jim Conley, I'm Ed Trefsker, and we'll catch you next season. This has been the USCHO Weekend Review Podcast, a production of U.S. College Hockey Online. Visit uschocom slash podcasts to listen or subscribe. 